good to see each of you here this morning. Glad that you are here. Uh, I'd like to read to you a thank you card got from uh, Aaron and Rebecca Harris. It says, Dear Pleasant Hill, just wanted to write a quick note and thank you for your prayers and recent gifts. We are so very grateful for your continual love and support. We hope all is well on your side of the ocean. Much love, Aaron, Rebecca, Annabeth, and Miriam. And they do have, they send out a newsletter via email. If you're interested in that, uh, where's Sarah at? Where'd Sarah go? Nursery. Nursery. You can get with Sarah. Sarah can tell you how to sign up for that. But uh, those are home folks that are serving over in Africa, uh, working on Bible translation. Uh, nothing particular as far as announcements uh, to make you aware of, other than in two weeks on uh, Saturday night, November 3rd, Sunday, November 4th, that is time change. We will fall back one hour. I always like to fall back. I don't like to spring forward. I like to get that extra hour there. I mean, they could keep falling back, and eventually we'd be, anyways. Uh, but anyways, uh, that, that's it on, on that. Just as far as uh, prayer list, just continue to pray for uh, Israel and what, what all is happening over there. And uh, pray for those that are still being held hostage. There were some, a couple of Americans that were released. Uh, also, pray for the Altman family. I just uh, saw this morning, a young man that just graduated in 2023 uh, from Pierce County, was killed in a car wreck uh, Wednesday. I don't remember his first name, uh, but uh, they're having a service at Laura Chapel, a graveside service at Laura Chapel. I think it's Tuesday morning. But the Altman family, and that's all... All I know, I don't know uh, any of the names, but just pray for them. A uh, young man was 18. I don't know any of the circumstances other than that he died in an auto automobile accident. Uh, continue to pray for those that are on our prayer list. And as we begin our worship service today, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you. We ask that in this time as we meet together, Lord, that uh, we all bring cares and concerns, worries, anxieties with us but Lord help us to just lay the, those aside for a few moments and just to turn our attention to you Lord as Corey Ten Boom said years ago if we look around in the midst of our circumstances and trials we'll, we'll get fretful we'll get worried but if we look up we have hope and Lord, I pray for those that may be struggling today with whatever the issues might be. I pray, Father, that you would give them hope, that you would give them encouragement. Father, I pray that we'd be used by you to be a source of encouragement to others, as well as being encouraged ourselves. And so, Father, we turn our attention to you to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift up his name, to make much of him to shine the spotlight on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would minister in this place today. Father, that uh, again, all that we sing, all that we do, would just point to you and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you are able, let's all please stand and sing to God be the glory.
Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings of life. Lord, we just thank you, God, for allowing us to be in your house again today, Lord. And God, we pray for all those that's on our prayer list, Lord, the ones that's in hospitals, Lord, nursing homes, ones that are at homes, Lord, sick. And God, those that's lost loved ones, Lord, just be with those families, Lord. And God, for our services this morning, Lord, I just pray for Brother Joe as he comes before us and brings your word, Lord, and just be with him and continue blessing him and his family, Lord. And God, for the singing, Lord, I just pray for our choir. Lord, just everything, Lord, that we do, Lord, we just want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Sin and left a crimson stain here. 
Barry, I know you wanted to go with him, but I'm glad you stayed. It was tempting. Take your Bibles and let's look in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, we continue in chapter 6 as we look at uh, the Lord's ministry. And John's focus is to show to the Jews and Gentiles, uh, or Jews and non-Jews, if you will, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He's not just a historical figure. There are those today, Jews, who claim that Jesus is just a historical figure that tried to lead a revolt against Rome and the Roman soldiers uh, crucified Him for His efforts. That's what I heard a conservative Jewish commentator saying the other day. Uh, there are a lot of Jews who still, don't, still do not receive uh, Jesus Christ as the Messiah, do not accept Him as Messiah. One day they will know. And I, I do say this in regard to everything that is going on in Israel and Gaza. Uh, God is not through with the people of Israel. Romans chapter 10 and chapter 11 lets us know that. But let me just say this. God's plan for Israel is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to continue looking at this today. And I want to ask you the question. I want to put the question in your mind. It's similar to a question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16. But I would just want to ask, you, ask you the question, who is Jesus? And if Jesus were here physically in person today, would you receive him? Would you follow him? And you say, well, yes, of course I would. But imagine... What we see here in the text, how his own did not. Let's get into the text. In John chapter 6, beginning in verse 41. And I'm going to read down through verse 59. We're not going to get all the way through verse 59 today. But I invite you to stand with me as we read God's word together. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the, for the life of the world. The Jew, Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever." These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's uh, pray for just a moment. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would uh, give enlightenment to our minds, our hearts, give understanding. And uh, Father, I pray that uh, you would pull back the veil, help us to see Christ clearly and what his uh, words are teaching us here. Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we will get more in depth next week or more in more detail. I will go over when Jesus talked about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's not saying that literally that we're to eat his flesh, drink his blood. Uh, but what he's talking about is that salvation is found through him. And we'll deal with this. Uh, I, my plan is to deal with that more next week. But I just want to ask you the question, as I mentioned earlier, who is Jesus? 
See, what you believe about Jesus, what we believe that the Bible teaches, what you believe about Jesus determines your eternity. People say that they believe in a heaven and a hell, and some people say, I don't believe in a heaven or hell. I believe that when you die, that's it. That's just it, it, everything ceases to exist. If that's the case, then what purpose, what meaning does life have? If there is no purpose beyond this life here, then our life really has no purpose whatsoever but to just eat, live, drink, party, do whatever, because you're going to die and that's it. So get all you can while you're here. That's, that's not true. People know that even in themselves. And how do we know that? Because Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has placed eternity in all of our hearts. In other words, we know that there is a creator. We may not, we, you know, people may say, well, I believe he's this or he's that or that, you know, but the Bible, God reveals himself to us. And we see here that Jesus in this interaction that he's been having with people in his own, uh, near his hometown of Nazareth, even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we know that, but he was raised in Nazareth near his hometown the Jews of his day did not really, a lot of them, did not accept Jesus as a Messiah. And so someone would say, well, why should we if they didn't? Well, John explained this at the beginning of his gospel in John 1. He said in John 1 verse 10, He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so there were Jews that did receive Christ. Obviously there were because the disciples were all Jews. The early church was made, uh, there at Pentecost, was made up of Jews who received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then as they began to spread out, the gospel began to spread, and it went to the Gentiles. That's us. Now, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. I mean, that's just the easiest way to explain that. Uh, and so the, the gospel spread out because the gospel is for all, all people. It's for everyone. The, and the word gospel just means good news. That's what it is. It's good news. And so Jesus is ministering among his people. And we saw last week where we, you know, the scene where Jesus had fed the multitudes and he multiplied the fish and the loaves of bread and fed the multitudes over 5,000 men and uh, you count the women and children anywhere from 10 to 15 to 18,000 people that Jesus fed and they had more left over. It goes back to what you would find in Numbers chapter 11 when the people of Israel were complaining they didn't have anything to eat and they were complaining to Moses and Moses said, where, where can I get food to feed all these people? And God provided the manna from heaven. And so they have this understanding. They have this knowledge of what God in the past has done. And that's why he talks about the, the bread from heaven. And, so that, and he told them last week, he said, you seek me, not because you saw the signs and believed, but because you ate the bread and were filled. He said, don't labor for the bread which perishes, uh, or for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. That's verse 27 of the same chapter. We, we looked at that last week. So the, multi, the multitudes were seeking Jesus because he fed them, not because they had committed themselves to him or that they believed that he was and is the Messiah. We, we see that in verse 26. John 6, 41 through 43, of which I just read, it says that the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. You have to remember, they came looking for Jesus. But they came looking for Jesus because they wanted him to feed them again. They wanted him to give them this bread. And that's why he said, don't labor for the, for the food which perishes. He said, you seek me because of what I've done. And, you know, so they came and you see it says that they complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven Jesus therefore said, answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. They were, they were grumbling. Familiarity breeds contempt. They had seen Jesus raised there around them as a boy, not knowing who he was, that he's God's son. They believed him to be the son of Joseph. Some of them had heard the story of his miraculous birth that, you know, that uh, 
that Mary was pregnant, conceived by the Holy Spirit, divine birth. They had heard this story, and we, we, saw, we, we will see later that the religious leaders accused Jesus of being born of fornication, that, that his mother Mary had had sex with a Roman soldier or someone else and gotten pregnant and used this story of God got me pregnant to cover up her pregnancy. That was going around, and Jesus would be confronted with that, and we'll see that later uh, as we go through the Gospel of John. So these people saw Jesus, and they didn't really understand everything about him. But I want to just remind you, you and I would have been probably very much like them. I mean, they had not seen some of the things that he was doing. But Jesus, in the Old Testament, was foreshadowed, was prophesied that he was going to come, that the Son of God was going to come, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. They're looking for him. And at the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3 says that uh, God will send his messenger before his anointed one. And that was John the Baptist. 400 years from Malachi to the beginning to when John the Baptist appeared on the scene. And John the Baptist began to, to, to preach a message of repentance and baptism and preparing the way of the Lord. He said, I'm not the anointed one, but I'm preparing the way for the one who is coming after me, who is following after me. He was talking about Jesus. Now that is John the Baptist. This is the Apostle John who has written this. So there's two Johns that we talk about. But the Jews were complaining about him. And I wonder, is it not still true today among people today? They, many people, they want a Jesus who meets their needs and expectations, yet they never want to really commit to Jesus. In other words, they want Jesus to be a genie in a bottle. Now, <clears throat> I realized I've crossed that generational bridge. And a lot of my illustrations, young people don't always understand. But most of you in here, not everyone, but most of you in here, how many of you remember the show, I Dream of Jeannie? Ah, see, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say that. And you remember Larry Hagman played, I don't remember the character's name, he played a major, who? No, it don't make no difference to my illustration. But we want to have a genie kind of similar like that, that whatever we say that the genie will do for us. And we want Jesus to be like that, that whatever we need, whatever we want, all we got to do is come to him and that Jesus will meet our needs. And listen, Jesus will meet your needs. But we, we oftentimes get confused with our needs and our wants. We, we tell that to our children sometimes, all right? Maybe even our grandchildren. They say, I need this. I, I, I have to have this. No, you want it, but you don't need it. Need is something that is necessary. Want is something that is desired, that's nice if you can get it, but it's different than a need. And we, we want Jesus to meet our needs. We want Jesus to meet our expectations. But Jesus laid down some expectations that he has of us. And that we are to follow him. And so I ask this question. Who is Jesus? Is he someone that you are fully committed to? To follow? To do whatever Jesus says to do? I mean if Jesus were to say. And people always say. Well you take it to the extreme. But if Jesus were to ask you. If he were to impress upon your heart. That you were to drop everything. And sell all you have. And move somewhere. And begin to serve him somewhere else. Would you be willing to do that? When I was up at Bible College in Louisville, uh, two brothers that were, uh, we, we took classes together, uh, Dwayne uh, uh, Ewers and uh, I don't remember the other, but anyways, their parents, Herbie and Debbie. Herbie was a chemical engineer up in the Kingsport, Tennessee area, had a very high paying job because he was a chemical engineer. But Herbie and Debbie were also believers. And as they had grown in their walk with the Lord, they felt, they sensed God was leading them to the mission field. And so Herbie left the chemical company and then began preparing to go onto a mission field, not knowing yet where they were going to go. And they ended up going, I can say this now because they're not there now, but they ended up going to Indonesia. Did you know that Indonesia 
has the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. And when you think of Indonesia, Indonesia is made up of over, I think it's like six or 700 islands that make up Indonesia. But they have the largest Muslim population of any, larger than Saudi Arabia, larger than Iran, larger than Iraq, larger than Afghanistan, larger than Turkey, Indonesia. And Herbie and Debbie went and served in Indonesia because God they felt the Lord had called them to that. Now, I'm not telling you that God's going to call you to missions. God may not call you to go any further than across the street and speak to your neighbor. God may not call you to go any further than the co-worker who works down the line from you or works in the cubicle next to you or who drives the, uh, the truck uh, in your car. I don't know where God's going to call you to do and what God's going to ask you to do other than he's going to ask you to follow him and serve him wherever he leads. We sing that song, wherever he leads, I'll go. And most of the time, we don't mean it. We'll go, Lord, as long as it's convenient for me. We'll go, Lord, as long as I'm good with it. And, so we make our, and when we do that, what we do is we place ourselves upon the throne instead of God. I read a thank you note from... Aaron and Rebecca, Orville and Donna's grandson, and, their, and his wife and their two grand, great-granddaughters serving over there in Africa, seeking to translate. But I'm, again, I'm not saying God's going to call you to go to a nation. People always say, I, I'm not going overseas. Listen, don't ever begin with God telling God what you're not going to do. Just say, God, like Isaiah said, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Just look what Isaiah said in Isaiah 6 when God said, whom shall, I, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. It may just be across the street. It may be just across town. But Jesus is worth us following and following him faithfully. And his own people, while they didn't recognize him, as most of them did not recognize him as a Messiah. Some did. It's amazing. It, it just as I was studying this week, I was amazed. His own people, they complained about him. Said, How can you say I'm the bread that comes down from heaven? I mean, it, isn't this Jesus, the son of Mo, J Joseph and Mary? We know him. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. What's going, is this guy touched? Is this guy off in the head? I mean, that's what they're thinking. Do you, you just kind of read between the lines. They, like, they, and they were murmuring about him. And Jesus told them, says, answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. Don't, 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 don't complain. He says, he goes on, he says in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. We will deal with that more next week. But, but Jesus just said here, you're having trouble believing who I am. And it amazed me as I began to think about this, about the number of people that knew and recognized Jesus who were not necessarily Jews. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, I just want to read this to you. There, there are several people I want to point out. There's a Roman centurion. It says here in, in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, which is where he's at now in the story here in John 6. He, he went to Capernaum on a number of occasions during his ministry. This is not necessarily the time of chapter 6 in John, but he's in Capernaum. And it says when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion, that's a Roman, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, that is astounding right there. If you just stop right there, that a centurion would come up to Jesus and call him Lord. But he says, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. So here's a Roman centurion who comes to Jesus and said, Lord, my servant is at home. This servant whom I love, he's, he's dreadfully tormented. Get, can you heal him? And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But look what the centurion says. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. 
When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Here was a Roman centurion who had faith enough to believe that Jesus could heal his centurion, but he also had faith strong enough that he said, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. I'm not worthy that you should even come to my house. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even a Jew. I'm not worthy that you should come there. And Jesus says, he said, if you just speak. He said, Lord, I'm, I'm a man that have people under, you know, I'm under authority and I have people under me. And all I have to do is give the order and they do whatever I say. All you have to do is speak. And Jesus said, I've not found such such great faith, not even in Israel. Remember John 1, he came into his own, his own received him not. Jesus says, this man had a faith to believe. We find in Acts, there was another centurion by the name of Cornelius that Peter went to. And so it's amazing that his own people who are looking for a Messiah, expecting. But see, their expectations were that that a military king would rise up and free them from Roman domination. And restore Israel to the glory days of David and Solomon. But see, he came the first time as a suffering servant. And when he comes back, it will be as a ruling and reigning king. So this Roman centurion, earlier in John's gospel, in John chapter 4, you remember the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman at the well? In John 4, verse 29, this woman, after her encounter with Jesus, see the Samaritans were considered outcasts. Jews would not affiliate with Samaritans unless they just absolutely had to because they were considered half-breeds. They, you know, they're, they're... genealogy, their ethnicity. They were Jewish and Gentile mixed. And so they were considered to be unclean, impure, not worthy of of having anything to do with to to the Jews. But Jesus was not afraid of a Samaritan woman. And he had this encounter with her at this well side. And after her encounter with Jesus, she goes back into the village in verse uh, verse 28, the woman then left her, her water pot This is in John 4, verse 28 and 29. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the man, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. We already covered this. But I just, this this multitude of people that is now complaining about Jesus, they sought him because he had multiplied the fish and the bread and they ate. And they come to him, and, and not one of them asks the question, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? I mean, they ate the food. They ate the fish and the, lo- and the bread. And yet they didn't ask the question. And that's why when you often hear me pray, I'll I pray before I preach it. Lord, give enlightenment to our eyes, to our minds that we might see, that we might understand. Because Paul says the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. That's in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. And so I pray that our minds, I understand that, that the Holy Spirit would reach in and touch our hearts, our minds, to help us to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus came to die for us. In Mark chapter 7, there was an interesting encounter. Jesus had their, uh, she's called a Syrophoenician. She's a Gentile woman. Syrophoenician was along the coast there. And this woman came in chapter 7, verse 24. It says, from there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. 
The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. I don't have time to unpack all of that. He's not being rude to her. He's not being condescending. But he he just says, he's talking about the the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people. And she says, she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when he had come to her house, and when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. What faith she expressed in Jesus that she would not let go when Jesus said, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. He wasn't calling her a dog. There's a lot to unpack there, but, and we don't have time for that. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the, even the dogs eat from the children's crumbs. She had a faith to believe. What about the Jewish people? What about people in churches throughout our nation today? We call ourselves a Christian nation. That is, that, that, that day is, that ship has done sailed. We still have a number of Christians in America, but we have a number of Christians who are Christian in name only. They're not really committed to following Christ. And it should bother us. It should break our hearts. And listen, none of us are perfect. I mean, you've heard me say this, and I'll say you again. I mess up every day. There ain't a day that goes by that I don't sin. There ain't a day that ever goes by that I'm perfect. And I do everything I should the way I should, when I should, and how I should. There ain't a day that goes by that I do that. But I, am, I tell you what I am. I am forgiven. And I'm loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves me. He loves you. Even when you're not perfect, even when you don't have it all together, Jesus loves you. And he's worth and worthy of our worship. When I talk about it, when I pray to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, it's like taking a spotlight and shining the spotlight on Jesus because I'm not the the one you need to be looking at. It's Jesus. I want you to see Jesus. It may be my voice you to hear, but it's his voice I want you to hear. I want you to see him for who he is. And this Gentile woman had the faith to believe. Just a couple of chapters over, we'll get there in a little while. Not today, obviously, in John chapter 9. If we were to get to John chapter 9, some of you would be seriously concerned. But in John chapter 9 is a story of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. This man's a Jew, born blind, never seen the light of day, never seen a color, never seen anything. Jesus heals him. And the religious leaders call him in and begin to question him about how he was healed, about his healing. And if you, if you go and read in John 9, they, they said to him, what happened? He said, this man, one of my eyes told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And I have my sight. And he didn't even know Jesus yet. And you read this story, he comes to know Jesus, and the religious leaders are questioning him, asking him, But it says in verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. They said, you weren't really blind. We know, who's his parents? They called his parents in. The man's, I mean, he's older than 18. They called his parents in and said, is this your son? They said, it's our son. Well, how did he receive his sight? Was he really born blind? Yes, he was born blind. We don't know how he received his sight, but this is our son. And so they called this man in again and asked him. And this man says to him, just we pick this conversation up in verse 24. 
So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. Now, they're, they're telling him. They're asking him. They're not believing his story about how he received his sight. But yet they say, give God the glory. They're like putting him under an oath. We know that this man is a sinner, talking about Jesus. They said, we know he's a sinner. What about themselves? But they said, we know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? The boldness. Then they reviled him and said to him, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not, you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. It's amazing. They said, give God the glory. So he bears witness. It's not, a, this man's a sinner. He said, isn't it amazing, guys? You're calling him a sinner. He said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. He said, one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. He said, it's amazing. It's unheard of that anyone born blind has received their sight. And yet, you refuse to see. In Mark chapter 5, some of you will be familiar with the story. It was a man that was demon-possessed and lived among the tombs. And the, and the surrounding villages were terrified of this man. They would, sometimes they, would, they were able to subdue him and they would chain him up. And he lived among the tombs. Nobody lives in a cemetery. And especially if you were Jewish because that'd be, you know, it's kind of unclean to be around dead bodies and stuff. But he lived in the tombs. He was demon-possessed. Oh, man, people say, I don't believe in demon possession. Let me just say this. Hollywood certainly does. What's coming up this month other than my wife's birthday? Her birthday is the 31st. But happy birthday, early. This man was demon possessed. And when Jesus approached where this man was at, he came running out to him. And just listen to what he says in, uh, as this demon-possessed man runs out to Jesus. Mark chapter 5. You'll find this in Matthew and Luke as well. <coughs> Excuse me. But this man, he comes running out to Jesus here in Mark 5, verse 6. And when Jesus saw from afar, he, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. That's the deacon. The, not deacon. That was a slip there. I did not mean that, guys. Seriously. The demon spoke through this man and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. This demon, he said his name is Legion. He says, For we are many. There are many of us in this man. This man had many demons inside of him. And yet, in spite of the fact this man was demon-possessed, he recognized Jesus. And Jesus cast the demons out. And you know the story, he cast them out into the, the, the herd of the pigs there, the, the, the swine, the hogs. <coughs> and they ran down the hillside into the sea and drowned. And the villagers were, were terrified. Verse 15, 
the, the, the people in the countryside heard what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And you would think they would have said, Hallelujah. This man is healed. This man has been set free. But instead, it says, and they were afraid. I mean, when he was running around like a madman, demon possessed, wreaking havoc, terrifying people, that's the time to be afraid. Not when Jesus. And now they're afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Jesus has set this man free and they're terrified and they want Jesus to leave. See, there are some of you that you may be terrified of Jesus. I'll tell you something, Jesus is not one to be terrified of unless and except you never receive him. Because one day, Paul tells us in Philippians, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You will either do that and hear well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Or you will hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Who is Jesus? Is Jesus one that you will follow? See, these people did not want to. And I mentioned at the beginning in Matthew 16, I preached the, uh, this text for you back when I was still just filling the pulpit before you had called me as your pastor. In Matthew 16, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, uh, I want reading right with my glasses. In, in verse 13 of Matthew 16, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some Elijah and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I ask you, who is Jesus? If you just believe he's some historical figure he is a historical figure but he's much more than a historical figure he is the living son of God he's not the son of God who was crucified and laid in the tomb and still lays there he's the son of God who was crucified laid in the tomb and three days later came out bodily and 40 days later ascended back to heaven to the right hand of God to some of you that may not make sense But Jesus declared it. And he was declared to be the Son of God with power when God raised him from the dead. Today may be the day that you need to receive Christ. It's not through walking in the aisle. But if you today know that you need to receive Christ, I encourage you to make public that you have chosen to follow Christ, and that you have re received him as your Lord and Savior. And that you want to follow him in believer's baptism. I will be here during the invitation if that's what God has spoke to you. But maybe you're here as a child of God. And you've not been fully committed to following Christ as you know you should. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But you know, I need to be doing more. And it's not, we're not saved by our works. But you know, following Christ is more than just picking up your Bible once or twice a week and praying once, twice a week. It's about following Him. It's about being forgiven. Not being, it's not being perfect. But I challenge you. If Jesus could take 12 disciples and one betrayed Him, if He could take them and change the world, He can do the same with the people of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. But we'll either be like the Jews and not believe 
or we'll be like the others and believe by faith. Which one will you be? Would you stand and let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time today. Thank you for your word, which is eternal. Lord, none of this makes sense unless your Holy Spirit opens our minds and eyes to understand. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a people. Lord, while we're not perfect, we're far from it. But we are forgiven when we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And Father, you receive all who come to you through Christ. There is none that you will turn away who desire to come unto you. I thank you for that promise that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. been good to worship with you today. Glad to have you here tonight, 6 o'clock. We'll be back for our evening worship. Look forward to seeing you then. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Blaine Hill, close us out, please, sir.